The most famous experiment we do to dream telepathy was a little pilot study that Jerry Garcia suggested to us. Right. This was the concert uh, yes, visualization. Yes, they were going to be playing six concerts in Long Island, and halfway through the gig, a sign flashed on the screen, you were about to participate in an ESP experiment. And then the next sign said, Malcolm Besant is in the Dream Laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. You are going to see a photograph. No, you are going to see an art print. Look at this art print and try to send it to him. And then the um, staff member of our Dream Laboratory would throw a coin, and one coin would be one slide, one coin would be another slide, and on the screen was this big, super big art print of an emotional portrayal by some famous artist. And then the dead would talk about the art print, and by that time the audience was under the influence of <laughs> one substance or another, so they went along with it. <laughs> yeah. So there's no music going on. They, sh they stopped the show for this? Yeah, they did, but then they started the music again while the picture remained on the screen. Ah, okay. Remained on the screen for about half an hour, and then our dreamer, whose name was Malcolm Besant, who was an English psychic, um, would be trying to incorporate that image into his dreams, and he was he was quite successful. It was only six attempts, but we got what we call borderline statistical significance for those six nights. Oh, excellent! From and a bunch of trippers at a concert. That's all right. Six concerts. Six yes, concerts. Yes. Yeah. And now there's a Grateful Dead's archives at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And they want to have a special exhibit devoted to that experiment. And I just found out that our laboratory assistant saved all 12 of those slides. Oh, great. And so we know exactly what pictures were used. And he is going to donate them to the archives. In the meantime, the article was printed in a dentistry journal, by the way. And... <laughs> One of the great regrets of my life is I didn't have the Grateful Dead sign a few copies. Ah. Those are collector's items. I could be retired by now. Now, you you once bragged to me that you have seen the penises of every one of the Grateful Dead. A few of them. No, not <laughs> a every few one of, of them. them. It wasn't every one. And I'm not saying I bragged. <laughs> I mentioned you it. You mentioned it. And what was the context? They were, they were peeing in a campfire or something? The context was that Mickey Hart had gotten a new rifle and wanted to try it out <laughs> on his rifle range. Oh, boy. And so they went off to the rifle range, which was sort of a sacred place. And, of course, um, many of them had been drinking beer at the house, and before they used the uh, rifles, they had to urinate, so they did this in a little ceremony, like in a circle, <laughs> with me included. You know, it was no big deal, but I was saying, just think of all of the female fans who would love to know the details and they're not getting any well and, and some of the male fans you know let's, let's not male leave fans out the... too yes that appeals <laughs> to everybody so anyway that was a very notable afternoon because after everybody had tried out their old, the old rifle mickey said to me as a courtesy stan would you like to try not knowing that I actually had practiced riflery at summer camp. And I have a badge from the National Riflery Association making me sharpshooter first bar. <laughs> and I have the bullseyes on the targets to prove it. <laughs> this was back in the 19, um, early 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. Anyway, I took the rifle and I tried shooting one time and I hit a bullseye. Wow. And that amazed everybody so much. 
Not, I'm going to quit while I'm You quit ahead. while you're ahead, exactly. Yeah, so I nice. just laid it down. I said, now I think we're ready for the new <laughs> rifle. And they just couldn't believe that I even knew how to hold a rifle, much less get a, the best bullseye of the afternoon. Nice. Nicely done. How so, did you meet Mickey? Because you, you and Mickey have been Well, let me finish friends. this story oh, oh, first. Oh, sorry, and I'll sorry. Tell because this all There's ties more. together with how I met him. Okay. So then Mickey took his new rifle and fired it. And then Bob Weir wanted to fire it next, and Mickey said, now be careful, it has a kickback. Bob Weir thought he could handle it, but no, it kicked back and hit him in his eye. Oh. And Bob Weir said, oh, I'm going to have a black eye tonight when we perform. So all the shooting stopped, went back to the house, did the proverbial trick with raw meat, put it over his eye, and then they went to perform. Now, that was the night that Mickey Hart had sent a private plane to Nevada to pick up Rolling Thunder so the two of us could meet. And so, sure enough, at intermission, who should I see coming down the aisle but this Native American with a very colorful Western shirt on and beads and a beautiful woman on each arm. And I walked up and I said, you must be Rolling Thunder. And he said, you must be Dr. Krippner. Yeah, so that's how we met. Wow. Now, how Mickey Hart and I met was a slightly different context. I was at a concert with a friend of mine because I like music from India, and Ravi Shankar was playing. And his accompanist at the time was Ala Raka, the world-famous tabla player. And Mickey Hart had been studying tabla with uh, Ala Raka. So we were invited to a party for Ala Raka, and at the party, the host the, said to, to me, there's going to be a musician here tonight who wants to talk to you about hypnosis. And I said, fine. So the musician did show up, and he was very dramatically dressed with a long black ponytail and black and white harlequin suit, and he didn't even want to talk to the other guests. He wanted to go to a private room and talked to me about hypnosis because he was using hypnosis with some of his students. So I listened to what he was doing and gave him some tips and told him how to keep from hurting anybody and what the danger signs were in case somebody was overreacting. And so I thought that I had done my instruction for the night. And then just as we were about to go out the door, he almost apologetically said, by the way, do you like rock music? He said, I love rock music. I heard the Grateful Dead last night. He said, then you heard me perform. I play the drums for the Grateful Dead. You had been at the concert the night yes. before. Was that in New York? Yes, that was in New York City. Fantastic. So then we made an appointment to do some hypnosis with him at Maimonides Medical Center, where the Dream Laboratory was located a, a few days later. And when word got out that Mickey Hart was coming, Everybody arranged to have their coffee break at the same time so that when he came in, they could see him and get his autograph. And, and there were like two dozen people in the, who materialized in the lobby <laughs> when he sauntered in. And he was very, very gracious, signed autographs, talked with people, came with me. We went into our soundproof room, and I hypnotized him. Very, very excellent hypnotic subject. And... Um, what we talked about remains private because it was a personal issue, but a very pivotal issue in his life. So I hypnotized him again sometime later in California, him and Bill Kreutzmann, the other drummer, and we spent hours. He has the results of this in his vaults, and I had time speeding down and slowing Speeding up and slowing down, I had them suffused playing in the color red, playing in the color green. They playing were playing the while, while... Oh, hypnotized. yes, they were drumming all the while. They were both excellent hypnotic subjects. They were both hypnotized. And in one interview, Mickey said that those hypnosis sessions brought him and Billy together so that they were like one organism playing and... It radically changed their way of playing music and therefore it changed the whole Grateful Dead. 
Nice. Well, that's a little exaggeration, but that is my <laughs> contribution to rock and roll history. All right. Beautiful. I wonder if musicians uh, in general have higher hypnotic ability than the average person. Yeah, very possibly. Because to be possibly. especially a percussionist, I imagine, you're, you sort of have to enter an altered state to, I mean, you see them, you know, each each hand and foot are doing separate rhythms, right? They're all doing different things. And to be able to pull that off, you must have to enter an altered yes, state. Yes, but you go into, you go overboard and your skill falls apart. You have to find the balance. And I have to say that uh, Mickey Hart and Bob Weir and Phil Lesh and Billy Kreutzmann, who uh, I hold in, in, in very high respect, uh, were not only excellent musicians, they knew a lot about the history of music. Yeah. And they knew a lot about musicians who had short careers, who had gone off the deep end. Oh. And within their own ranks, their percussionists um, were very short-lived. Yeah, and some especially of them the ones in spinal from tap. alcohol or, or, or drugs abuse. Yeah, yeah. You've seen This Is Spinal Tap, where the drummer keeps exploding. Yes, that was a wonderful movie. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Um, what uh, Jerry Garcia, by the way, yeah. often mentioned, not often, but sometimes mentioned, he thought he might have been the reincarnation of Claude Debussy. Really? Yeah. Uh, whole Grateful Dead, the five who I've just mentioned, once went to all four operas in the Wagnerian ring cycle in San Francisco because they loved the Wagnerian music so much. It was right up their alley with all of the percussion in that. And all Wagner, which is better than it sounds, right? Yes, so yes, someone so famously the said that. Uh, musicology <laughs> of that uh, opera series. Yeah, so he thought he was the reincarnation of Claude Debussy, yes. the pianist, right? Or was he no, the composer, composer. Okay. who composed okay. Claire de Lune, uh, among yeah. other things. Ah, uh, right, and the, the sea. But the also mar. composed uh, chamber music and opera or two. Uh, a lot of piano music. Yeah. What what other musicians? I know you met uh, David Byrne backstage at a dead show. Is that oh, right? Oh, yes. I smoked marijuana with the Who with and the with who? the band. Really? Yes, I yes. I didn't know uh, the, the Who story. I, I rarely smoke story. marijuana, but when you're with famous musicians, I mean, you don't turn down history. No, exactly. <laughs> you don't turn your back on history. So Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, the whole, the whole band? The, what? The, the who? You were with the whole band? Oh, yes, or? the whole band. That was thanks to Mickey Hart and the Grateful Dead because the two of them were performing together at a huge venue. And during intermission, Mickey said, we're going to go over it and get high with the who. Do you want to join us? I said, I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> so over I went. But the interesting thing was I had met the who several years earlier before they were that famous. They were playing in Baltimore, Maryland, where I was involved in a research project. And they stayed at the same hotel that I stayed at. I went to hear them the night before. This was in the days when the Who would um, take a guitar, and I think it was Pete Townsend threw the guitar on the stage and burned it. Yeah, they smashed it up. I think yes. Hendrix burned them. I don't know. Maybe the Who did as well. I remember uh, yeah, several did. Pete Townsend smashed them all up at the but end anyway, of the show. But anyway, I was... At breakfast the next morning, I just dropped by their table to tell them how much I enjoyed it, and they told me to sit down. We had a lovely chat, and I said, that was a very dramatic way to end it by smashing and burning that guitar. And Pete Townsend, oh, yes, that was an expensive guitar, too. <laughs>